For the Climate Discussion Nexus, I'm John Robson. With the latest readout video from our free Wednesday Wake Up email newsletter and a shout out to what was formerly considered the chilly city of Winnipeg, Manitoba, now sweltering due to climate change through highs ranging from 22 to uh, 10, which is in 26th spot on our list of all-time views by city. And with a sour comment on the relief with which publications like Scientific American greeted the end of a period without dangerous hurricanes, emailing, quote, Weeks of eerie quiet in the Atlantic Ocean Basin are over. Tropical Storm Francine in the Gulf of Mexico is expected to hit Louisiana as a hurricane tomorrow, end quote. Eerie? How about pleasant? I mean, seriously, who goes, whoa, that's creepy, no hurricane? For all their best cheerleading efforts, however, Francine only made Category 2. And Scientific American said, quote, Forecasters aren't sure what has kept a lid on storm formation, especially given that ocean waters, the fuel for hurricanes, have been exceptionally warm, end quote. Yeah? Well, maybe they're not the fuel. But no, dogma is dogma, and it must prevail. So they guessed that, quote, it could be some combination of Saharan dust that is blowing off the western coast of Africa and a shift in a wind pattern over the continent, end quote. Anyway, the point is, there must be storms, even if there aren't. In the newsletter, we also express predictable dismay at predictable media coverage of the Trump-Harris debate, including on climate. For instance, the New York Times' Climate Forward was full of the usual boring hype, including this gassy paragraph. Quote, the outcome of this presidential election could be critical to determining whether the United States, the world's biggest historic source of the greenhouse gases that are dangerously warming the planet, cuts its pollution enough to keep global warming within relatively safe limits. Scientists say the window for action is rapidly closing, end quote. Oh, scientists say, do they? And what do they say the United States could do unilaterally to keep global warming within relatively safe limits, given that if every nation on Earth met its Paris Accord targets, the very same models that blah 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 dangerously warming pollution decade to act say it would reduce temperatures by 2100 by about one-tenth of a degree, a rounding error, not a bomb for a fevered planet. Phooey. And what is the United States meant to do about its historic greenhouse gas emissions? Go back and change its policies in the 1920s? Readers are not well served by such journalism. In the newsletter, we also delve into the weird weather in the past file, courtesy of Modris Eckstein's 1989 book, Rites of Spring, The Great War and the Birth of the Modern Era, which says, quote, In December 1915, the rain, which had been intermittent since early September, became interminable in Flanders, Artois, and Picardy. More fell there that month than in any December since 1876, over six inches. The beautiful days of August had become the stuff of dreams. Rifle barrels clogged with mud and would not fire. In the wake of a British attack on December 18-19, the Germans reported that most of their wounds were caused by bayonets because their opponents' rifles were jammed, end quote. And if that kind of thing happened today, I'm talking about the rain, not the rifles jamming, you know what they'd blame. Mind you, they might even blame the rifles jamming on it. Oh, and given the comparatively quiet hurricane season that we've been having so far, CNN pivots to, quote, The Atlantic Ocean is enveloped in a rare and strange calm that has flummoxed forecasters and reset their expectations. And the whole thing could be a glimpse of what's to come as the planet gets hotter, end quote. Though, of course, when things get active again, they're not going to say, Oh, the science really isn't settled. They're going to say, Gotcha. In the newsletter, we also complain that Reuters' Sustainable Switch newsletter on all things climate-related tells us, quote, Today's newsletter covers the war in Gaza, as dozens of Palestinian families were killed or wounded in a designated safe zone on Tuesday, according to Palestinian officials. This came as the United Nations Human Rights Chief urged action to end the nearly year-long war in Gaza, condemning Israel's blatant disregard for international law in Palestinian territories, end quote. So, it seems that green is the new red, but... What exactly has any of that got to do with climate change? Meanwhile, our climate hypocrite of the week is Sharon Kamathy of Reuters Sustainable Switch because, quote, Today's climate focus attempts to answer a question I have had in the back of my mind while writing the last few newsletters, which have highlighted severe heat and extreme summer sun. Where do I go on holiday, end quote? Well, uh, given that you think massive carbon emissions cause such disasters, and much more besides, isn't the answer a staycation, or, as they say in Quebec, a week in Balconville? Heck no, not for the likes of us. 
claiming that, quote, it's far too hot for me to go to the usual European affordable holiday spots like Spain, Greece, France, Italy, or the Balkans, end quote, Reuters sent a bunch of people out to canvas northern Europe and Alaska, and, quote, cruise operators, hotel companies, and airlines are adding trips and accommodations to meet rising demand for temperate destinations, end quote. Say, isn't that all terribly carbon-intensive, especially the flights? Meanwhile, on the plus side, we say, you go cap. The Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers, which in our view has too often tried to rally around the white flag on net zero and related policies, has now denounced the Canadian federal government's aggressive Bill C-59 that attempts to ban greenwashing by forcing companies to prove that any claim of environmental virtue is true, reversing the presumption of innocence. CAP wants the bill repealed, but if it's not going to be, they say, quote, the Competition Bureau should make it clear that parties such as climate advocacy groups are subject to the same standards in respect of their own communications and representations, end quote. Environmental defense was shocked, of course, but sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander, even if they don't like the taste of it. In the newsletter, we also hitch a ride on a Vogon spaceship, because the latest, greatest exercise in absurd climate modeling hubris is the frankly preposterous project to create digital twins of the Earth inside the models, to overcome the models' hopelessly limited power to simulate the actual climate by pretending they can do it this way or something. Now, fans of the BBC comedy classic by Douglas Adams, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, we we'll recall the business where some aliens, fed up with endless philosophical debate, create a giant supercomputer called Deep Thought to solve the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything, only to wait seven and a half million years and get the answer 42, and then have to build another even bigger computer to frame the question more precisely. This computer is so vast and mighty that it actually has to be an entire planet. In fact, the Earth. But now, satire has become reality. As Andrea Saltelli explains in a guest post, Digital Twins of the Earth, Science or Pseudoscience, on Roger Pilkey Jr.'s The Honest Broker Substack. Because the problem here is that the only way to simulate the Earth reasonably well would be to build another one. And then you'd be just as perplexed by its nonlinear complexity as you were with the first. But at least The Hitchhiker's Guide was satire on purpose. Oh, and by the way, in Adam's tale, Earth Mark II was cancelled which is what should happen in real life as well. Meanwhile, here on Earth One, a major British union, the GMB, has turned vocally against this green energy transition. The BBC reports that, quote, Labour's green policies are costing jobs and hollowing out working-class communities, the leader of the GMB union has warned, end quote. Well, that was a short honeymoon for Labour, now wasn't it? And it's not about to resume since Gary Smith, whose title of General Secretary has a distinctly bullshit ring, warned against, quote, decarbonization through deindustrialization, end quote, and it's far from clear that there's another route. But it gets worse because Smith added, quote, we're going to see huge reductions in our carbon emissions, but at what price, end quote, and then called for an honest debate on the government's net zero plans. So here's our opening position, quote, be it resolved that the UK will not see huge reductions in carbon emissions, so it's all pain for no gain, unquote. The exact opposite of what they promised. And now, back to satire. Because the late great P.G. O'Rourke once wrote, in The Atlantic in April 2002, that, quote, Beyond a certain point, complexity is fraud. When someone creates a system in which you can't tell whether or not you're being fooled, you're being fooled, end quote. Which brings us to wind energy and its complicated contractual arrangements with modern electricity grids. It's not just a simple matter of bidding on contracts and supplying power when needed if you're the low-cost producer. Oh no. It's become a mare's nest of renewables mandates, portfolio standards, feed-in tariffs, first-to-the-grid rules, dispatch curtailment, hype, blame, and losses that somehow no one saw coming. And yes, you're being fooled. Now, debates over alternative energy, including its alleged cost advantages, often take place at a very high, almost abstract level. And yes, the general macro rule is that aggressive climate policies cause rising energy costs, and often deindustrialization as well, not to mention brown and blackouts. And this generalization is borne out across a wide range of jurisdictions. But when someone does go down into the weeds, as Parker Gallant frequently does with respect to energy pricing in the Canadian province of Ontario, it's amazing what muck he finds there. Including that when there's too much power, the authorities pay conventional plants not to produce or else 
buy their cheaper power, and then dump it at a loss onto interprovincial or international markets, while buying the more expensive wind and solar, and then trumpeting its growing share of generation, and shtoom about the billion dollar losses from this crazily, impenetrably, fraudulently complex system. As we predict with some confidence, you'd find wherever you live as well, especially if the green zealots designed the power system, or at least tried to. And now, on another more cheerful note, to quote Arthur Dent from, again, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, we're all gonna die. But the reason that's a cheerful note is that, in our seventh installment in our Cheerful Chart series, we show that around the world life expectancy has been skyrocketing in the last century and a half, for rich and poor alike, along with, well, fossil fuel use. And this is a climate crisis? Well, the alarmists may say it just means 30 more years of suffering the ravages of climate change before dying prematurely at a ripe old age. We say enjoy it. But either way, there's no denying its reality. People are living a lot longer on average. And now, back to that vast simulation of Earth's climate, the actual Earth. In 2021, we reported on a pair of studies that analyzed satellite-measured data and found that clouds were not shielding the Earth's surface from incoming solar radiation as much as they used to, causing an increase in heat absorption at the surface, which accounts for much of the warming experienced in the past few decades without reference to greenhouse gases. And an especially surprising feature of those studies was that while extrasolar energy was accumulating at the surface, the total amount of long-wave radiation at the top of the atmosphere going out was rising. Whereas climate orthodoxy insists, and indeed it must insist, on the notion that more CO2 and other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere are trapping more of that radiation and letting less of it escape back into space, thus heating the planet. Now, one of the teams from 2021 is back with a new paper with updated data that shows more of the same. Over the past 20 years, the net inflow of energy into the Earth's atmosphere has doubled, mostly because more is being absorbed at the Earth's surface. But at the same time, more is being expelled by the atmosphere, the opposite of what will be expected from increased greenhouse gas levels absorbing the stuff. So yes, climate is complicated, and the models just don't begin to capture its complexities. And finally, and what did anyone expect? From the CO2Science.org archive, we bring you a study of Helianthus annuus, also known as the sunflower. They're at their cheery best these days, around Ontario at least, and they turn out to like CO2 a lot. So, if yours seem a bit taller and brighter this year, you can thank your SUV. For the Climate Discussion Nexus, I'm John Robson, and I'm no mere abacus. <laughs> Thank you.